before I commence talking about snow gum dieback, the first thing I want to do is focus on connections because connections, I suppose, are, are really what bring many people to this seminar, whether you listen to it live or you listen to it in a recorded version sometime later. This is a year that has tested connections in all sorts of ways. Uh, from the start of the year, many of us found that our connection with the landscape and the environment was, was very much tested in the first month of the year. And then as the year wore on, connections with people around us and place was tested again. At the end of this year, many of us are looking forward to reconnecting with, uh, with people and places um, and finding perhaps a, a reconnection with ourselves. And, and for a lot of people, that reconnection will come about through a reconnection with the places they love and places like the mountains in particular, as many of us will aim to escape either the heat at the beach or, uh, or other, others of us will escape to the mountains and spend time in the, the places that we've grown up with and we have a very long connection with and a love of. While I speak of those connections, it's important that we acknowledge not only our connections with the country, but we acknowledge the country itself. And we acknowledge the connection between our indigenous members of the community and country and acknowledge those indigenous custodians of the, of the country. In particular here in the ACT, the Ngunnawal people, but also in the area that I'm displaying this, this beautiful image of, the Narrago people. Much of the talk will focus on work conducted in Kosciuszko National Park. And, and in particular, I want to acknowledge the Narrago people from that perspective and their elders. When we think about snow gum, and certainly when I think about snow gum, an image comes to mind that embedded itself in my psyche decades ago. This picture was embodied on a, or represented on a poster that you could walk into the Wilderness Society store in any city, you buy this poster, and it was a poster that came with the words, Australia's natural heritage. It's a picture of a tree, snow gum, growing on Mount Nelson, Victoria, and it embodies a lot of the, uh, the values, the messages that snow gum in, you know, represents for many people. You can see a tree in an extreme environment, crusted with ice and snow, its bark almost red raw, a tree that has clearly withstood the test of time. It has dead stems around the base and dead twigs at the top, and yet it's still there. And that image of snow gum is one that many people connect with. Now, our understanding of snow gum and the role that it plays draws a connection with the human history in the mountains, and in particular, the human history um, of this fellow here is illustrating some key alpine concepts <laughs> to students, and that's Alec Coston. Alec played a particularly important role in the mountains, and it's, it's worth taking a moment to acknowledge Alec's role. Alec played a major role in the post, uh, well, after the park, Kosciuszko National Park had been gazetted, a major role in rehabilitating that landscape, but also played an important role in understanding ecological soil and perhaps most importantly to this talk, the hydrologic function of the Alps. Now, one of the important things that came out of early work that Alec Coston conducted was the contribution that snow gum makes to hydrologic function in the Australian Alps. And this graph captures some of that important element. On the vertical axis, you can see that uh, you can see represented precipitation that occurs underneath trees in parts of Kosciuszko National Park. And you can see the areas indicated on the diagonal lines, Piper's Gap, Charlotte's Pass, Saw Pit, Saw Pit Creek, and Boggy Plains. On the horizontal axis, the x-axis, you can see precipitation that is falling on ground in the same area as is represented by tree cover. And diagonally represented in the hashed line is a one-to-one -one line. So an indication of if rainfall precipitation on open and treed areas in the Alps were equal, that's the line we'd expect to see representing 
the relationship between treed areas and grassed areas. But those lines, those straight lines there, the lines that are not hashed, the solid lines don't fall on that hashed line. They are above that line. And what they represent is that snow gum in place, snow gum forests, forests have the capacity to capture precipitation, particularly in windy conditions. Under still conditions, this effect is largely lost. But in windy conditions, snow gum canopies capture precipitation and that precipitation falls to the ground. Now under freezing conditions, snow gum also captures cloud and fog. Under non-freezing conditions, the, part, the droplets are too small to be harvested by the canopies, but in the freezing conditions, the vapour condenses onto the leaf surfaces, surfaces and freezes, and then eventually falls to the ground. Now, the effect here is something that you can see that increases, and that effect is the increase in precipitation associated with snow gum. That effect increases with the amount of precipitation that falls, but also increases with elevation. So as we increase elevation, the role of snow gum from a hydrologic perspective increases too. But snow gum also has an additional impact in terms of its capacity to capture in trained snow. So if you spent time up in the mountains during winter, you'll know that snowfall often comes with strong wind and snow gum has the capacity to entrain that snow that is moving across the landscape and keep it in place. Now the big difference here represented on this graph is the change on the vertical axis here in snow depth as we move from dead snow gum to live snow gum. That live snow gum has an additional capacity to retain snow around its base. And so snow gum woodlands retain additional snow than in dead snow gum areas or in areas with different vegetation. Now in part, this additional snow depth may be associated with just a redistribution of snow cover across the Alps, but it may in capturing snow, capture snow that might otherwise be lost to the high elevation catchments. A key element here is not only that there's more snow though, it's that the melt of that snow is delayed and it is longer. So there's more snow and it is retained for longer. And from a hydrologic perspective, that's important because sudden melt of snow can lead to overtopping in the, re in the reservoirs. And so water that might otherwise be retained within alpine catchments flows downstream. So snow gum then has a capacity to not only increase the amount of, of water that is retained in the landscape, but it has the capacity to retain that water for a longer time. And you can get some idea of just how much water can be lost or how much snow may be, may be lost under dead snow gum, simply by looking at this graph. It may be in the order of 40% less than under tree cover, uh, under living tree cover. Now, the critical importance of snow gum's contribution then is borne out in a, uh, in a very nice paper from Randall Donahue and others at CSIRO. Now you can see here a representation of the Murray-Darling Basin and, and what Randall did here was characterise Murray-Darling in terms of yield zones and represented there are uh, the yield zones in terms of their capacity to yield water. So we have an extremely high yield zone represented in purple and a very high yield zone in blue and the southern high yield and northern high yield zones. Now those two zones, the purple and the blue, the extremely high and the very high yield zones, comprise a very small part, a small percentage. You can see there in the graph, and sorry, in the table, that the extremely high yield zone comprises 0.3 of a percent and the very high yield zone, 2.1% of the total land area in the Murray-Darling Basin. But combined, they, com they yield 26%, more than 26% or the flow into the Murray-Darling Basin. So a very small area contributes a disproportionately large amount of water into the Murray-Darling Basin and loss of water in, those, in that part of the landscape is going to have a significant impact on the areas well and truly outside of the mountains. So this is not a mountains issue. This is a large scale landscape issue.
So let's turn to snow gum and at least for a moment define what it is that we're talking about because this can be an area of some confusion and I expect perhaps if you're listening to this you'll maybe disagree with my classification of the snow of snow gum. But first let's accept that snow gum generally here on the on, on the mainland we define as Eucalyptus porciflora. Now there are other species. There are species like Micheliana, Parvifructa. There are species in Tasmania, Coxifera. All have the name, the common name, snow gum. But generally what we're talking about when we think of snow gum, especially at high elevation, is this species Eucalyptus porciflora. If only it were that simple. Of course, porciflora is broken down or has been broken down for some time into a, a number of different species or subspecies. Now that may be where the disagreement comes about, whether you see these as species or subspecies, but we'll worry about lumping and splitting some other time. But at this point, let's just accept that we have five species represented in common language as Eucalyptus porciflora. Of those five, four have very narrow distributions or relatively narrow distributions. Acerina, Eucalyptus acerina and Eucalyptus hedraea, for example, are restricted to only a few locations and, and hedraea in particular to a very small area around the Falls Creek Resort in Victoria. Acerina, largely on Mount Borbore and Mount Torbrick. On the far right, we have Eucalyptus nephopla and Eucalyptus debusevilli to other species that also have relatively narrow distributions. Those two species are largely restricted to areas above 1600 metres. The Buzavilli here in the ACT and parts of New South Wales nearby, and the Fopla to the highest elevation parts of the landscape in Kosciuszko and in Victoria. The last species in there, Porciflora, has a much, much wider distribution. Covers a very wide elevation range from zero up to 1600 metres and extends from South Australia all the way up into northern New South Wales and, and perhaps into, into Queensland. Now it's the two species on the far right that we're particularly interested in today. And bear in mind we're talking about two species, Nephopla and Debusabili, that are restricted in range to above 1600 metres. The other species down the bottom, Eucalyptus lacrimans, is a species that for all money in the field, looks like Eucalyptus nephophila. However, there are some key differences, and the key differences are rather more impressions that you gain from the tree. It's a very narrow, very sparsely wooded tree. They're, they tend to lack lateral branches and they're weeping, so weeping snow gum. But Eucalyptus lacrimans, like the other two species, is a very narrow range. Lacrimans is restricted to the areas around the Kyandra Plains, Long Plain, Nungar, and Gulf Plain, and some areas around Adamidipi. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about lacrimans as well. So it is these three species that are of particular relevance today, because those are the three species that at the moment we see, well, a substantial dieback event taking place. So let's turn to that dieback now. And let's maybe take a slightly chronological perspective of the way this has played out over the last decade or so. In around 2007, 2008, with, uh, with a couple of friends, I spent some time in the mountains and on the advice or the request of National Parks, stopped and had a look at a few trees that they had indicated were suddenly perishing to what they believed severe drought stress. The outcome was that, well, there was a very clear sign that was associated with those tree deaths. Those tree deaths were dispersed across a large area. And not only were they perishing very quickly, but they bore some very telltale signs. And you can see those telltale signs here. Deep scores, horizontal scores across the bark. And not only in the bark, but into the sapwood. And those scores, to me, having worked in forest industry before, were recognisable as the damage by wood boring insects. The only insects really that can achieve this kind of damage in live timber. Now a key element to my observations at this point were that the damage that we were seeing at the time was consistent with historical evidence. So trees that had obviously been dead for decades bore exactly the same signs. 
Now, as I mentioned, they're suggestive of a wood borer. They were very much indicative, of, rather, of a wood borer. But a key element here is that not only was the stem, the crown, dying, but there was clear evidence that the entire tree was perishing. So rather than as a fire passes through, the above ground elements die and then the tree re-sprouts, what we were seeing was the complete death of the individual tree. So on the image on the left hand side, you can see some little shoots that have shot away, but then shortly after they shot away, they perished. And that was typical of the trees in the landscape that we were seeing in that time. Also typical was that those trees were trees that had regenerated after the 2003 fire, not from shoots at the ground level, but from shoots in the canopy. And it wasn't just one or two of those trees that were succumbing, it was every single tree. And then, around about 2012, a slightly different picture started to emerge on Long Plain. That the populations of eucalyptus lacrimans started to disappear. Well, they'd been disappearing for some time prior. Now, this image is an image of a photo plot. And the photo plot was being maintained by threatened species officers. And the focus was not the overstory, it was the understory. Because understory species were changing over time. And these photo plots were intended to document that. But between this image in 2002 and this one in 2012, something else changes. And that substantial change is the loss of the overstory or, or much of it. So during that period between 2002 and 2012, not only were we seeing dispersed dieback of high elevation snow gum in Kosciuszko National Park in the snow areas, so eucalyptus nephophila, we we're also seeing eucalyptus lacrimans ever away. By the start of last year, that effect had extended and there was widespread tree death on Long Plain and the areas around. And again, wood borer damage was clearly obvious on each of those stems. So the same, what we would term proximate cause was at play in both locations and both species. By the start of last year, suddenly, a problem that had been slowly eating away at snow gum forest became very clear. Around Perisher, Guthiga, Threadbow, and closer to home here in the Magin, evidence was, or well, the indications were, that snow gum wood, that wood borers were impacting very heavily on snow gum stands above 1600 metres and on Long Plain at around 1400 metres. Three species, Eucalyptus lacrimans, Eucalyptus nephophila and Eucalyptus debusivili, all under attack, all by what appeared to be the same insect. Now, from a distance, it looks just like fire kill. It looks like a dead tree standing in the landscape. And perhaps that's possibly the best way to understand why this happened slowly, and yet we suddenly came to realise what is playing out. Of course, people working in the mountains were seeing this on a daily basis, but it's only recently that we've started to put together the scale of the problem. Now, how do we recognise it? And what's the process that's underway? Now, the first signs of, uh, of snow gum dieback are subtle. And we'll come to the insect involved in a moment, but the first signs are quite subtle. On both of these two pictures, you can see that there are some tiny little drill holes. And if you were, um, well, if you weren't aware, you would think that those drill holes, because they've been drilled in such perfectly straight lines, have been, um, have been put there by a person. But, of course, this is not a person's damage, this is an insect damage. So the first sign that we have that there is a, an infestation by wood borers is a sequence of little drill holes, generally either in a straight horizontal line or in a vertical line. And they're around about five millimetres in diameter, very circular, and they're clearly arranged in horizontal and vertical lines. And in many instances, they have this stain associated with them that you can see on the right hand side. It's, the tree weeping, what we refer to as kino, out of the, out of the stem, 
and that stain has been left behind. Now the next step in the process here is that the bark begins to split because what has been happening underneath those holes is that an insect or a group of insects has progressively been feeding on the bark and on the outer, and on the outer wood. And once that feeding has progressed to a reasonable stage, the bark is no longer viable. It collapses and we have what we can see on the right hand side, the collapse of bark along horizontal lines associated with those horizontal, horizontally arranged holes. So the bark collapses, it splits and it dies at that point. And then because the flow of water from the ground to the canopy and the flow of sugars from the canopy to other parts of the plant have been interrupted, plant then, the stem begins to die. And the entire stem dies progressively as the insect feeding progresses and ring barks the tree. So this bark collapse associated with frass clearing holes is a key part of the process. And as the process progresses, the bark splits horizontally, as you can see on the, uh, vertically, as you can see, or at least parallel with the stem, splits on the, as you can see on the right hand side, and the entire stem begins to perish. Now by this stage, the canopy is almost entirely dead. On the left hand side, while the process is in an, in an advanced state, externally from the canopy, there's no, there's no indicator. The tree will continue to function and the failure of the tree will come very suddenly. Of course, the process has been running by that stage, perhaps for years. And then once the bark falls away, the damage done by the insects that have fed underneath is plainly obvious. The bark exposes this dead stem that in many cases is riddled with these reasonably wide galleries, five to, to 10 millimetres wide and, re, sorry, deep and then much wider. So 10 to 30 millimetres wide. And that width reflects the fact that in many instances, not just one individual is, a, is feeding below the bark, but in some instances, five or six individuals will feed collectively. Now there may be this dark staining present and that again is the product of kino, a gum flowing into the injury as the tree attempts to heal an injury that is being enacted by the insect. And also associated with the injuries are these deep penetrating holes that, um, that allow the insects to find safety and then move between different uh, horizontal gaps. Pete, you have a question? Yeah, we just had one question. Someone's just asked to explain what our uh, frass is. Okay, that's a good question. The frass, and we'll, perhaps if I can just take a step back to those frass clearing holes. As the insect is feeding, it's chewing away at the bark and is processing the timber very quickly. Wood borers, like a lot of animals, have difficulty processing cellulose. And what the wood borers are after is not necessarily the cellulose, that hard material that makes up the tree, but the contents of that cellulose. And so the insect needs to process that material quickly. Of course, if you're eating a lot of material, then you're going to produce a lot of refuse. And for an insect, we'd simply call that frass. And so it's the feces of the insect. And the insect needs to get rid of that and get it out of the way. And the best way to do it is just make a hole and throw it out. So that's what we have, these frass clearing holes. And if you have time and you're in the mountains, it's um, a wonderful way to spend a minute or two, just watch little puffs of frass exit the holes. <laughs> okay, so, so as the, uh, the process continues, the tree eventually dies. And, and at this point, I'm talking about complete failure of the tree, not just the stem. The tree may have several attempts at regrowing. You can see a tree here that's had several attempts at regrowing. It's regrown epicormics off the stem. So these little sprouts that grow directly out of the stem or from sprouts that grow out from the lignin tuber, the large woody mass below ground that stores carbohydrates and they perish as well. So we're talking about the death of the entire tree. 
So if we're going to think about dieback, and I'd expect that there will be questions immediately about the ultimate driver, and, and of course that's the question that we have too. If we're going to think about dieback, let's try to understand dieback before we dive into this specific problem, or perhaps not specific because we're crossing multiple species boundaries. So let's think about what is dieback. Dieback broadly is something that we think of as the decline of canopies. Canopy decline and death is how we would broadly characterize dieback. Now there are lots of other definitions that try to separate dieback from decline. But if we're going to look at a tree and think of it as dying back, the signs are in the canopy. Now dieback, when we try to understand dieback, we need to think of both proximate and ultimate, proximate causes and the ultimate drivers. So the proximate cause, the process, the insect, the physical event that leads to the death of the tree in the moment. Whereas the ultimate driver we might consider as the predisposing factors, the inciting factors that lead to that outcome. And it is that question of what is the ultimate driver that has proved particularly vexing in dieback outbreaks, especially in Australia. We'll come to why that is the case in a little bit. But the last point to really, really take away is that dieback events all have spatial and temporal elements. And we need to understand that both the spatial and temporal elements to dieback if we have any chance of understanding what is playing out before our eyes and what we need to do about it. So if we were to construct a conceptual model of what dieback is, it's a combination then of predisposing and inciting factors. Predisposing factors that introduce stress in one way or another to a tree or a stand of trees, and then an inciting factor that precipitates a dieback event. And we need these two things because in the absence of an inciting factor, the process cannot commence. If dieback happened without inciting factors, it would be happening all the time, unchecked. So we need a tree that is predisposed and then we need to incite. We may also, in some circumstances, have what we term the accelerator. And generally that accelerator is a biotic agent, an insect, in, certainly in this case. The accelerator feeds upon the process that has been set in train by the inciting factor and capitalises on, in many cases, stress trees. Now those predisposing factors we can think of in a number of ways. They might be stand structural aspects. We're familiar with forest succession where one species might be replaced by another. And that is a consequence of age dependent processes leading to structural decline in stands. It may be associated with edaphic, so physical conditions of the site being particularly stressful. And those conditions like stand structural elements predispose stands and trees to stress. But it is in the presence of a stressful event an inciting factor, perhaps a severe windstorm, perhaps an extreme drought, perhaps water logging, something that incites the process and really gets it moving. And then the accelerator comes in, finds stressed trees and knocks them out. Now accelerators don't always exist in dieback events, but there are many insects and fungi that act in that role. And an example that we might draw upon to understand why we need to have such a clear picture of these predisposing, inciting and accelerating factors might be borne out by this example on the Monero High Plains. If you're unfamiliar with the issue, the Monero High Plains were affected by dieback in the early part of the 2000s. <coughs> the situation as it stands now is that there is virtually no managum, Eucalyptus viminalis, standing live in that landscape. And that happened as a consequence of this proximate cause on the right hand side, a Gonipterous weevil feeding on the leaves, progressively attacking again and again and again until the trees have no resources left to respond. But where are the predisposing and inciting factors there? We have the accelerator, the insect, 
But where is the predisposing and inciting factors? There are ideas around what the predisposing factors were. Perhaps landscape change, clearing, the application of fertilizers, changes in the hydrology associated with human interaction. But also where was the perturbation, the inciting factor that kicked it off? We can't have dieback without an inciting factor, otherwise we have it going on all the time. And if that was the case, we wouldn't have forests. We have forests, and so that gives us evidence that we need these inciting factors. So where was the perturbation that set it in place? Well, in the absence of historical data, we simply cannot answer that question. We need to have a view across the temporal domain of dieback and what precipitated the event itself. And in some respects, we were a little lucky when it came to the Monero dieback event, insofar as the trees in that landscape, in some instances, produce annual tree rings that allow us to peer into the history of those trees. And in some instances, we can see that those trees, their growth, went through several phases of slow growth. But it was in the early 1990s where growth really fell and then remained relatively low, with the exception of one sudden spike in growth, remained relatively low right until the end. There is no way we can gain that kind of insight by looking at a tree that dies in the moment. We need to understand the historical element. We also need to understand the spatial component. And here, looking at this view of Guthiga Ski Resort, Perhaps not clearly to you, but to me, I can see clearly the, the trees at lower elevation browning and losing canopy. Take, this photo taken in December last year is an indication of the process that is still very much playing out in the mountains and the tree deaths that perhaps we have in front of us. So to try to understand what is playing out, we spent some time in the field in December last year to put some data around the observations that we've made so far. Coring trees using an increment borer to extract tree ring evidence, sampling insects, identifying where they were and trapping them as well, as well as mapping dieback within stands. And while there are many messages that come out of this, perhaps a couple of the key messages that came away from that, that data was first of all, a quantitative demonstration that at the very least, dieback in the mountains is definitely associated with this wood borer damage. Now that might seem like an obvious thing to demonstrate, but we need to demonstrate these things quantitatively. And as you look at this graph, you can see on the, on the, on the horizontal axis, we move along a gradient of no through to low severity uh, damage to a tree. We're looking here at bark puckering associated with those underlying uh, galleries made by the insects. And as we move from a low severity to a high severity, you can see the probability of a canopy being in decline increasing sharply from slightly above 20% up towards 90%. So there is a clear association here between the two. But then at a landscape level, there's something else going on as well. That the likelihood, the probability of a tree being dieback affected is, appears to be very strongly related to elevation. To the point that at lower elevations, and we're talking here a lower elevation of around about 1600 metres, at a lower elevation, somewhere around 80% likelihood that trees are affected by dieback, falling to around 15% at high elevation, around 1900 metres, 1950. So there are landscape processes at play. And those landscape processes, because dieback events have a spatial domain, help us understand or put some color around this, this black and white picture that we see at the moment in terms of dieback. A key element of what we did at the time was trap at least one adult insect. And that insect is this character here on the left hand side, Forocantha master's eye, appropriately named the ring barker borer for its action on trees elsewhere in the, in the country. So this is not a species specific wood borer. It's been observed in 
uh, host of species across the eastern seaboard and in Tasmania. Now, while the symptoms are consistent with that insect, there is certainly evidence that there are more than one species of wood borer at play. And on the right hand side, you can see damage associated with the bullseye borer, Orocampa or Acanthocera. They are definitely present in the landscape, although the incidence of their damage is, is far, far lower. Now, what do we know about Forocantha? We need to understand the insect that we're dealing with. And at a broad level, Forocantha is an insect that we generally associate with drought stress. Now, while this work on the right hand side is not of Forocantha master's eye, rather it is of a far more important economic pest, Forocantha semipunctata, the message from Forocantha literature is fairly consistent, as it is for all wood boring or flow on boring, so bark boring, live bark boring insects, the message is pretty consistent across the literature. That as bark moisture content falls, the survival of wood boring and flow on boring insects improves. And you can see that very clearly here, that as you move from a 60% moisture content to a 55% and then to a 50% moisture content in the bark, survival of the insects increases from 30 doubling to 64% with only a 5% change in moisture content. And then shooting up to 85% with another 5%. Now again, that is not Forocantha master's eye, but the message here is at least plant stress is an important element that we need to have a handle on. But we also need to have a very good handle on the insect that's involved. Tomorrow morning, I leave here at around about 5.50 or 6 a.m. to head up to the mountains and start re-establishing these traps. These traps are intercept traps that over the course of the next six to seven, eight weeks will be in place as when we believe the adults will emerge from trees and we'll have our traps in place to collect as many as we can. The reason for that is we need to understand, first of all, what the species is involved but if possible, collect live specimens that we can work with in the lab. Associated with that, we need to also work on understanding tree growth and tree stress. And that is a combination of high resolution monitoring as well as understanding the hydraulic behavior and the, and the long-term growth behavior and stress indicators in tree ring series. And that is probably the most important element that we have on our side at this stage. That at high elevation, snow gum produces clear tree rings that allow us the opportunity to peer backwards in time. And that temporal element is absolutely critical because the evidence in front of us is that there have been outbreaks before. Here is a map of an outbreak that affected the Threadbow Ski Resort area in the 1960s, 70s and 80s. However, it just stopped. And it was a much smaller outbreak in extent. What were the temporal elements that, uh, that brought about that outbreak and what stopped it? And the evidence in front of us is that we can extract some of that knowledge, some of that data from the tree ring record as I've already mentioned. And we have a long legacy of tree ring data here at the ANU. And in addition to that, current tree ring data indicate that we can certainly date dead trees. So identify when they are affected, but also peer back in time to identify when the, the perturbation events occurred that perhaps preceded the onset of dieback. We also need to get on top of the spatial domain. And while we have remote sensing data available, well, this is where we need help. And this really is the ultimate appeal for help. As you leave your, your work, and perhaps you go on holidays for the year, perhaps you go up to the mountains, I'm asking you to help me by looking for the symptoms that I've just described. Now we have a website online. We have a number of mechanisms that everyone can use to report dieback that they see in the mountains, snow gum dieback, and in particular those symptoms. So briefly to those uh, online tools. 
The first one we have is embedded within the Atlas of Living Australia. And if you're a user already of the Atlas or you have BioCollect already installed on your machine, the Atlas of Living Australia is a portal that we are using and we have a project within the Atlas known as Snow Gum Dieback. And that's the logo for it and you can search for that and you can make reports of dieback at any time. Now a report is a fairly simple thing. It comprises really a name, a photograph of the damage you've seen and the location. You can, if you wish, add in more details, but a photograph and a location. And then we verify them, both in terms of looking at the photograph and then we'll be out on the ground as well in the coming months. But if you're not an Atlas of Living Australia user, there's you're not cut out of the picture here. If you jump online, we have a website, Save Our Snow Gum, and within Save Our Snow Gum, on the front page, there's a big orange button that says click to report dieback. And basically it takes you to a report form that works the same way. If you're using a device that has location services enabled, it will locate where you are, and it will also assign a date to when you're making the observation. Now you don't have to have that enabled, you can manually indicate where you are. And if you're making observations at the end of the day, you can manually indicate where you saw uh, the, the dieback affected tree. But again, like the ALA, the Atlas uh, record, we need a photograph. So a location and a photograph. Also, there's an opportunity here to not just make observations that you make this year, but maybe you've spent the last five or six decades out in the snowy mountains. And this summer you're looking through your photographs and you think, oh, hey, hang on a moment. There's some of that damage that, you know, we're seeing in the mountains now. But this photo was taken in 1959 when we were coming out of that party at Kareela Hut. Well, you can make those observations too. So record those. They are every bit as valuable. Again, where and when. Spatial and temporal, that's what we need. Optional, additional information, you can tell us something about the condition of the tree. Was it alive and healthy? Was it completely dead? And you can also describe the symptoms that were present, but you don't need to. A photograph, a location and a date, that's what we need. Now, quite a few people have been doing this already and we can get some indication now while we've got a reasonable number of observations in the ACT and across New South Wales, we only have a handful there, three in Victoria. And we know that dieback is affecting stands in Victoria. So the key takeaways at this point. We have associated snow gum dieback with a wood borer infestation. An infestation that there is evidence for in the landscape that it has happened before. But we have some real needs at this point. And while we can use tree ring data and monitoring of trees and surveys now to start giving us data on what's playing out now and what may have happened in the past and understanding tree stress, we need your temporal and spatial data to start informing our understanding of what's playing out now. I'll turn to questions. There's not a lot of time, but 15 minutes for questions. But before we do, I just want to acknowledge uh, a number of people and organisations. Much of the work that we've conducted so far has been supported by the Australian Alps National Parks Program and by in-kind support from the New South Wales Government through DPIE. Parisha Ski Resort has uh, been very supportive and this summer uh, we'll be supporting much of the work we'll be doing. And I want to mention in particular Mont. Uh, Mont have been very supportive over the last couple of months in particular in getting messages out to the community and also supporting us in the field. There are a number of people there on the right hand side that uh, at least I want to have their names up there to acknowledge them, um, but also acknowledge uh, and mention again those two portals through which you can make observations about dieback anytime. 
I might throw to questions. Okay, we might. All right, we might go to the questions which came through on email before the seminar started. We'll go through those and then we'll um, go to, to the room and the ones online. Um, a case you rose from the Snow Mountains asks, do you think that climate change and drought has sufficiently stressed the snow gums that they are now more susceptible to insect attack? Well, on, the, on those questions around what the ultimate drivers are at this stage, the things that we need to do is again, return to that idea of the spatial and the temporal components. And also perhaps what we know about the insect species that's responsible. Now, if we think about the spatial component, at 1600 metres, while we see very severe effect at 1600 metres, the effect barely extends below that. Now, that boundary, as I mentioned at the start of when I was introducing snow gum, the different snow gum species, may be associated with species. And, and there are differences in the physiological behaviour of snow gum species. The question is, to whether climate change is impacting upon those species at high elevation is something that we can, we can only come to by understanding the response of the higher elevation species or along an elevational gradient over time. And that's, that's something that we can extract from the tree ring record as much as from the current physiological record. What underlies that question, and really this is the question we are, we are all asking at this stage, what is the ultimate driver and, and what role perhaps does long-term trends in the mountains, do they play? We know that temperature was six and a half degrees above average in January of 2019. That is exceptionally warm. That question is something that we need to take on in understanding the combination of those edaphic elements and perturbations. The simple answer at this point is, I don't know. There is evidence that perhaps, but there is also evidence that this may be a disturbance associated process too. Uh, the next question we had uh, in mod three was, is the snow gum the only species affected? If we ultimately lose a large proportion of our snow gum forests above um, 1500 metres, what does this mean for the snowy mountain ecosystems and beyond and the landscape? Mm. I'll come to that last bit first because I, I, I think at the start of the talk I tried to touch on or at least give you a lead into to the to the kind of impact that a loss of snow gum at high elevation could have at a landscape level, at a national level, talking about an impact upon the Murray-Darling Basin. From the perspective of the ecological impacts, immense. Snow gum is the only tree species above 1600 metres. The loss of all tree cover, and you know, if, if that's where we are heading, and there's no indication necessarily that that is the case, but if you take it to its most extreme, loss of tree cover of the species that extends from 1600 metres to 1900, 1950 metres, would have immense ecological impacts, a complete loss of overstory. Um, in terms of the species affected at this stage, three species that we're aware of, Nephophila, Debusevilli and Lacrimans, all of them sort of in, in common terms referred to as snow gum. Okay, so one last question that was emailed through uh, from Marion at the Victorian uh, Department of Transport. Um, looking at the spread of the beetles, are there any lessons for the transport sector or for provisions of access into Alpine areas, particularly in a changing climate, such as um, roadside mm. maintenance, tourist accents, that kind of thing and looking at questions of, you know, vehicle hygiene, um, track closures to tourists, walking tracks, vehicle spread. Yeah, I, I, we, this is an issue that we discussed actually uh, very early last year when there was, um, when we hoped that this was a problem that was restricted in range, was the issue of can we, is it possible to quarantine materials moving between locations in the mountains? The important point to take away here, I suppose, when we talk about the spread and the dispersal of this insect is, is that it is a native insect and it is well dispersed throughout the landscape already. While it may benefit from disturbance, insofar as disturbing trees and stands may lead to additional stresses on individual trees, 
and then give insects the opportunity to impact upon those trees. There's no evidence at this stage that this is a process that is facilitated by transport, human transport. Uh, and, and, that, and the reason I say that is because we, we have observations of dieback wood borer outbreaks in, in very remote locations. For example, around Jigung, Mount Jigungle, for example, and, and, it, and that's not a high, highly used transport area. Yes, people are walking around in that landscape, but we're talking about a native in, insect that, dis, that has a natural disperse, dispersal around, around the landscape. Um, from the perspective of hygiene then, I guess the important thing, uh, we can contribute from a hygiene perspective, but as to how that would impact upon the dispersal of the insect, and it seems so widely distributed at this point, it's not clear to me how that might, might impact. Um, a question from Mike Baker is, are Snowy Hydro interested in this uh, due to the potential impact on water operations? And I'm thinking in terms of them potentially helping fund the research to find a solution. Uh, I have uh, talked through this with Snowy Hydro and, and I can say that certainly earlier in the year, they certainly expressed um, interest and concern around what was happening, particularly around the Long Plain area. Um, as to whether uh, they, they can fund, there's always opportunities to fund research, but, um, but at this stage, yes, they're, they're concerned and they are aware. A um, couple of questions just about the species again, but you've already highlighted the three yep. um, subspecies affected. Uh, what relationship is there between the 2003 fires and dieback, if any? Yeah, that's, that's a great, great question because that was a question that we were thinking on in 2007, 2008, when, when the outbreaks, when we saw these widely distributed tree deaths. And, and as I said, we saw trees dying that were recovering from the 2003 fire and they were recovering from shoots in the canopy. And those were, those were the only trees affected and every one of those trees we could find was affected. So one would reasonably then conclude that there may well be a legacy effect associated with the 2003 fire and that disturbance may play a very important role as an inciting factor that really kicks the process off. As to what role fire plays more broadly then, um, we need to peer backwards in time. So we might say, okay, well then fire plays a significant role. It, it could. But if we look backwards in time at the events that uh, played out in the Threadbow Ski Resort, we, we don't, there is no fire immediately prior to those outbreaks. While there was the 1939 fire, there was no dieback event following hot on the heels of that event. So while fire may play an inciting role, it's not consistent throughout the history of dieback in the landscape. Okay, here's one from Peter Murray. Great presentation, Matt. Uh, are the borers native? Yes, they are. And what are the optimal conditions for thriving in healthy snow gums? Well, it, I guess that depends on, on the species. Um, and we would have to turn to early work from Ralph Slatcher here at the ANU um, and work too from the 19, early 1960s where, um, where, um, where researchers fitted long-term or reasonably long-term um, dendrometers, these little monitors that, that measure the way that trees grow over time. The evidence in front of us is that, yes, snow gum is negatively affected by cold winters. So it doesn't grow during the winter and that's why we have clear tree rings. But then as spring warms up, the snow melts, they take off and they grow reasonably well. There's plenty of water in the soil and the air is reasonably moist and they, and they really grow very quickly during that initial period. But then during summer, their growth appears to sort of tail off. And, and as to what's playing out there, whether it is um, soil moisture that becomes limiting, whether it is atmospheric conditions, so the vapour pressure deficit that then impacts upon the, the way that the leaves are functioning, um, that's not entirely clear. But what is clear, that rainfall later in the growing season has a positive influence. So, you know, from that perspective, 
um, we might say that a season like, like this year, in which we have consistent rainfall, and let's hope that continues for a while, consistent rainfall might be a particularly good set of conditions for snow gum. One thing we need to be careful about though is while we would think that um, snow and cold is to the detriment of snow gum, it slows them down, of course that snow and long snow cover or you know long snow duration has a benefit for snow gum as well insofar as maintaining soil moisture. A complex picture. Uh, we've got a question from Megan. Uh, how can amateur observers distinguish between dieback and death from fires? Get right up and close to the tree. That's the best thing you can do. A fire affected tree will not have these deep scars. So if a fire was responsible for killing the tree, the bark will fall away and you'll just be left with these smooth silvered stems. So in a way, maybe that's why this sort of crept up on us because there are so many dead trees out in the landscape that a few more trees, and there are a lot of trees dying, but a few more on top of what was out there, was it's difficult to pick. What you need to look for are those deep horizontal scars. And if you're not sure, the, um, the form online, the little, you know, save our snow gun form where you can make your own observations, there's a link in the form if you're not sure, just click on that and it will take you to a gallery of images on the website. And anytime you can just get on the website and have a look at those images, those horizontal scars are unmistakable. I have a question from Ian. Matt, are you investigating soil depth and historical loss of soils associated with the presence of shrubs and deeper soils under snow grass? Soils presents a very complex uh, pathway forward. At, at this point, while, um, while the association between snow gum dieback and soils is something we certainly have in mind, in the immediate term in the next few months, our focus is going to really be on collecting historic growth data from dead trees and collecting and making more observations in terms of the insects themselves. A view towards soils is something that we are certainly looking at moving forward in the coming years. Okay, we've got lots of questions. So we might have to go a little bit over time to get through them, but it's you know an important topic, so we probably should. Um, Predisposing factors, what is the effect of aqueducts across the hillsides, uh, such as Falls Creek? Well, they're probably lower than 600 metres there. Yeah, okay. I mean, we're, we're now, I guess we're starting to dive into specific predisposing factors. And, and again, I suppose what I'll fall back to when I come to an answer there is aligning the temporal element and the spatial element with the cause that's proposed as the ultimate driver. What we need to do is reconcile um, each idea that we have when we start thinking about an ultimate driver. How does it match with where we see dieback playing out and its timing. The idea that perhaps aqueducts are playing a role or, or any other local factor, what we need to do is to think about what is the time course over which those aqueducts were installed or fire regimes were changed following grazing or the use of silver iodide to see clouds. All of those explanations, we need to put those back into the when did that disturbance event take place? Where did it happen? And then how does that align with where we see dieback in terms of extent? And um, I had a question, if global warming reduces the viability of snow gums at lower elevations, is there evidence of snow gums, gums growing at a higher um, um, evaluation instead in more recent times? Um, well, I guess there's, hit, there's, there's fossil evidence that snow gum has certainly moved in terms of its distribution across the landscape over, over very long periods. Um, if we see an impact on, I mean, to sort of come back to what we saw in terms of the, the impact associated with ele elevation and the uh, likelihood of being dieback affected. The higher elevation stands, the very high elevation stands, and we're talking here at the top of Mount Perisher, basically, 1,950 metres. 
those tiny little trees are not as affected as the larger trees downslope. And it's not a matter of size. We see smaller trees at lower elevations affected too. So if it is a landscape process in part, that at higher elevation, perhaps because of temperature differences, you know, let's follow that line of reasoning for a moment, then at higher elevation, perhaps those trees will at least be spared the worst, or perhaps the, their growth will improve. I mean, that, that is the kind of effects associated with climate change and global heating that we've been talking about for some time. What I would say though, is when we try to make predictions about what the vegetation is going to do as a consequence of changing global climate, we need to be very careful because if for a moment, this dieback event is related to climate and climate change, this is not the type of effect that we would necessarily have anticipated when we think about the impact on vegetation. We would say, oh, at high elevation, it'll get warmer, the plants will grow more. But here we are seeing an insect attacking trees. So we need to be careful about trying to, um, trying to predict too much about what the vegetation is going to do because it is complicated. Biotic interactions make things very complicated. We had a question about fire regime as an inciting factor mm. and if it's possible to return to the historical fire um, regime. I imagine the, the person who posed that question, I'm, well, I, I'm not sure. We need to ask a question about what the fire regimes were historically. And, and again, I, I might sound like a broken record because I keep going back to tree rings. But the tree ring evidence that we have in front of us, courtesy of, of John Baines here from decades ago, is that the fire regime has been through two major changes. From the uh, commencement of burning associated with grazing in the high country in which the interfire period shortened quite significantly. So we had multiple fires within a decade. Um, and then that interfire period extended once the, the national parks were put in place. Now, what we have then is not just a, a time now where fire is actively managed from the part of, of um, management agency, government management agencies, but we've passed through a period in which fire regimes changed immensely. The fire frequency increased. Increased on traditional use of fire or natural fire, in addition to a traditional use of fire in the landscape. It's doubly difficult now to think about returning fire regimes because we've been through a transformation in terms of fire regimes. The question we might need to ask in some places is did that, are we living out a legacy of the disturbance associated with the intensification of fire in the landscape rather than it's, than it's de, rather than the reduction of the use of landscape fire, but it's intensification during the grazing period. Again, it's a complex question. We have a question from Chris Brack. Um, he said, I know it's a different insect, but is there any relationship to the Monaro dieback? And if so, any chance it will stop as suddenly and, and, and unexpectedly as the Monaro dieback stopped in 2019? Well, Chris, I hope not. <laughs> and I, I don't say that because I'm saying that I hope this dieback event doesn't stop, but because as we, as, we, as we stand in the landscape on the Monero, there are very, very few live Eucalyptus viminalis left in the Monero. And it may be that the Monero dieback process ended because the food simply ran out for the insect or the trees were so sparse that population couldn't be sustained. As to whether there is a relation between the two processes, um, I guess time will tell. I mean, we are going to have to work backwards to try to understand whether, whether we can identify the process that has precipitated what might be plant stress that then led to wood borer outbreaks. Then perhaps 
step backwards in the same way with Monero. But I hope we don't have the same endpoint. Uh, Mark um, Hamilton asks, if we assume the dieback is a combination of extreme drought, fire and insect attack, what are the possible solutions to minimise or prevent further diebacks? Or is there a limited cost effective operation uh, humans could implement at a landscape scale? The landscape scale attribute of this process is, is really, you're right, is, is a limiting factor here. At a local level, maybe we could think about this at a local level. Maybe we could think about um, particularly high value stands. If we identify, for example, um, if you're familiar with the Charlotte Pass area in Kosciuszko, that's an area that even when Alec Coston was out in the field and in his papers, he highlights as an area that he believed was a climax community. It was the, the snow gum woodland as it existed before um, grazing and, and, and uh, post-European modification of landscape commenced. Now, maybe stands like that we treat as a special subset of high elevation snow gum. If we are concerned about their long-term future, maybe we need to think about those smaller areas as subsets that we treat specially. But to do that, what we need are, are control mechanisms in a way to slow the insect. And, and certainly that's something that we are planning on working forwards with um, here at ANU. We need to collect live insects and start working with their sensitivity to plant volatiles. Because at this point, the evidence is for Forocantha species generally, uh, that Forocantha have a, an almighty set of antenna on the front of their head, and that's not there just for decoration. They use those for, um, for sensing host volatiles. We need to identify what it is that they are sensing, whether they're sensitive to stress related volatiles or whether they're just looking for the same species that they grew up in as a larva. Certainly there's no evidence that they are tracking while in flight, they are tracking pheromones, uh, but rather that they find mates once they're on, on the tree. So what we, you know, what one would hope is that we can look to the use of host volatiles using the kind of insect uh, intercept trapping or looking into the landscape to identify and looking at the species themselves to identify what the natural predators and perhaps um, bacteria or fungi that might be, because everything does ultimately have something that eats it, um, where they are in the landscape and try to support those. Okay, there's just a few more questions and then I think that will be it. Um, Vic uh, Jerkus uh, asks, um, when the uh, Tuat decline started to become an issue in WA, academics got excited about Forocantha. Um, eventually they found the problem was in the roots because of soil changes in the absence of frequent mild burning, which maintained the eucalypt ecosystems for, for 40,000 years, just like every other so-called dieback um, event, please comment. That's a fair, fair comment, Vic. Um, Forocantha has certainly presented a problem elsewhere in the landscape. Certainly outbreaks of Forocantha recently around 2013 and 2015 have been, my understanding, have been associated with drought effects in Western Australia in the Jarrah in particular. Internationally, the effects of Forocantha are very much associated with drought effects, even in the lab where uh, Forocantha uh, larvae are introduced to filter paper. So we take out of, uh, out of the picture entirely trees and we use just a base cellulose material that has no chemicals, just water embedded in it. In the end, it comes down to the um, moisture content of the material that the insects are feeding on. Now, as to the role of changed fire regimes, and how that may be impacting upon rooting and soil depth. That's a, a, a very, very complicated question and one that's difficult to resolve. But again, as I think about the process that is underway, the two key things that we need to return to are those temporal and spatial factors. 
And a question that I would pose when we think about fire and fire regimes is that does the change in fire regimes and does the onset of dieback, does that logically match with the timing of changes? Well, does the dieback and the changes in fire regimes, do they match? We need to look at those spatial and temporal elements. And if we can't find some kind of alignment between the agreement between those, then, then we're, 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 left, um, we're left without an answer. Um, what we do need to do as a first, first pass, we need to put aside questions as to what the ultimate drivers are and focus on these issues of, can we identify evidence of plant stress that has precipitated or preceded this outbreak and bearing in mind there have been previous ones, preceded those previous outbreaks too. So we've just got one more final question on the line before we go to a couple in the room. Um, do you think feral horses and deer have an effect to tree stress? Um, I, I, I think this was, this was a question that we, we mused on at the start of last year, you know, what if, what if this is, is feral horses, then, you know, we, we really have um, strong motivation to act on feral horses. Now, the, the, at the risk of sounding like I'm just putting myself on repeat, um, we need to, again, ask this question about the spatial and temporal elements to horses and also thinking about what, what physical impacts they have as well. Maybe having horses in the landscape, depositing uh, manure everywhere, maybe that changes soil properties in some way, changes mycorrhizal association, soil fungi, maybe it does something. But again, we come back to this issue of the match or mismatch of the outbreaks themselves and the spread of horses across the landscape, where they are, how many there are, the density, um, and how that timing and their extent matches with the timing and the extent of dieback. So yes, it's certainly something that we've, we've discussed, um, but again, it's something that we can only come to once we've, we've nailed down these, these really fundamental questions around timing, space, and also um, plant behavior prior to dieback. Cool, thanks for the online questions. And a few people have asked just about, will this be put up online? Yes, it will. So we're recording this at the moment and we'll share it um, on our website, on the event page um, through YouTube. So we've got a question in the room, which I'll just go to now. Matt, David Durek. Um, first, a historical observation. Uh, if I, my memory serves me right, I first went into the Perisher area to ski in about September 1966. And one of my clear memories, having been used to skiing in Alpine Victoria, was the very extensive dieback from about Dana's Gap right through even up to be or almost um, into uh, the bottom end of Charlotte's Pass. And it was widely viewed at the time. It was simply left over from the 1939 fires. I mean, there must have been, none of us were looking for tree borer mm. scars, but I'm wondering if in fact, the dieback event was not just consigned to the Threadbow area, but it might be yeah. something for history. And I'm wondering if also Klaus Hunike's very extensive set of historical photographs might be of use in determining some of that, if they are of enough detail. But that's just an observation. But my question is one more about tree physiology. Um, my own observation is that even where trees are initiating growth from lignotubers, tr tubers, so the physiological process below where there is stem damage from tree borers, trees still seem to succumb to dieback. And I'm, I'm interested in your comments on that. Yeah, sure. I, I, actually, I will take your comments as uh, I'll respond to those comments too. I've discovered a love of historical photos that I, I never had before um, because those historical photos and, and also if you're listening and you're a member of a four wheel drive club or a horse riding club or anything, anyone else for that matter who's out in the landscape and you've been posting photos online, you know, I, I'm now trawling those photos looking for because so many of those photographs have evidence in the background. 
Um, so again, um, I'd love to see Klaus's photos, but, but if you have your own collection of photographs, um, I don't know, next time it's 45 degrees, get them out, stay in the shade and, and have a look at them. Um, look for those scars on the tree. So, so I'll have a look at that. In terms of the extent of, of dieback through Dana's, through to Smiggins in particular, certainly there's um, uh, had discussions here uh, last year in particular um, with some of the retired park managers um, and they, they recall that damage too. And, and in particular, they, they, we talked through the experiences of people like Dane Wimbush, who, who worked with Alec Coston in particular, and, and told me how Dane had noticed that there were these periodic outbreaks where um, wood borers, at the time, there was not really clear what it was, there was some association with, with uh, moth larvae. Um, it, it wasn't clear what it was, but, but there was a, sort of a discussion around, okay, well, that's, that's a process that comes up every so often. It appears to come up on the most disturbed sites. Dana's was a, is famously very, very heavily disturbed. Um, and it seems to come up on those sites and then disappear. So, so I think you're right. I, th I would say that there's, there was a, a, a little more extensive outbreak than just in Threadbow. I mean, that Threadbow map was really the limit of the aerial photography. Um, and we now have um, um, from Department of Primary Industry, um, historic photographs. Um, and, th and that's something too that we'll be turning to people like Snowy Hydro for as well, historic aerial photography uh, for areas so that we can start using those photographs as well as photographs taken on the ground. Insofar as the lignotuber issue is concerned, you know, in the end, we have to ask the question about why it is that, that trees die. And, and not to oversimplify things, but, but trees die because they just run out of food. Drought stress is, is a problem for a tree, but if you've got enough sugar inside the stem and you have the capacity, so you have bud tissue lying um, latent below the bark, then you can regrow. The process is costly, but you've got the sugars there. If you have a process that progressively depletes the carbohydrate store within the tree, and, and if we think about the Monero process, that's what we think was that issue there and, and what appears to be that issue of a lot of processes that have a long stressful experience or, or associated with a long stressful experience for the tree, that the tree progressively starves. It runs out of carbohydrates and then it lacks the capacity to survive. Now, from a snow gum perspective, those trees have, some of them have substantial lignotubers. Some of them, some of those lignotubers, uh, you know, you can see the stems arising out of the ground from the signal, sig single lignotuber, indicating that the lignotuber will be several metres across. And so for those lignotubers to fail, really what you need there is a sustained depletion of the carbohydrates within the plant. And the ones that shoot away and manage to, you know, put on a set of shoots that might be 30 centimetres high or so, they, so far as I can tell, they tend to perish um, during winter. You know, when they're buried by snow, there isn't enough carbohydrate in the plant to sustain them over that longer, over the longer haul during winter or in the middle of summer when perhaps plant physiological processes are slowed and they just can't sustain themselves anymore. Perhaps there's a fungus involved, perhaps there's some additional secondary biotic agent in, involved, but um, in the long term, I, I'd put it down to carbohydrate depletion and starvation. Well, thank you very much, Matt. Um, are there any other questions from the room? We're 21 minutes over time now, so. All right, we'll probably finish up there. Um, yeah, definitely encourage everyone to um, head on these websites and uh, do some research out in the field. And uh, people can also contact you if they've got any further questions or um, ideas or anything. That's well. right. I'm fairly easily locatable on the ANU website. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Okay, well, thanks so much for everyone who joined us online and thanks to people who turned up in the room today. All right. Thanks for listening. Fantastic presentation, Matt.